here are some questions to begin with. Why did Jesus happen when he happened? Why then and why there? Or, put it more broadly, why did two separate movements, the Baptist movement of John, the kingdom movement of Jesus, happen in the 20s, first century, in the 20s, in the territories of Herod Antipas, son of Herod the Great. Why then? Why there? Another way of putting it. Why is there so much fishy stuff in the Gospels? Why are we always hearing about boats? With the Sea of Galilee, let's begin there. Why the Sea of Galilee? Why boats? Why fishes? Why fishers? Why are all the major followers of Jesus from small fishing villages on the Sea of Galilee. Think of Mary of Magdala, the major fishing village on the Sea of Galilee before the foundation of Tiberias. Think of Peter and Andrew. They're from Bethsaida, a small fishing village to the north, and they live, Peter apparently, in his wife's house at Capernaum, which probably means he's not doing too well, by the way, at the fishing business. Another fishing village. Everywhere you look, fish. And Jesus is from Nazareth, a hillside village inland. What's he doing over there by the lake all the time? Is he there for the view? Is he there for the breeze? Why is he by the lake? Why does he sort of transfer his base from his native village of Nazareth inland, near Sepphoris, over to the lake? And why in the 20s? The great symbol, it, it's not an argument and it's not a proof, it's a symbol and a summary of what life was like on the Sea of Galilee in the 20s under the commercialization of the lake by Antipas is a boat. It's a boat that was discovered, oh what, almost, I suppose, 30 years ago now. What had happened was that the waters had receded during a drought and there in front of the now visible sand and gravel, you could see the outline of a boat. And it was a first century boat. The, the difficulty, of course, was to, to excavate it and restore it so it wasn't destroyed in the process because it was thoroughly waterlogged and was about the consistency of moist camembert cheese or something like that, or wet cardboard. And it was clearly a first century boat. It's been described as the Jesus boat, but I call it the Galilee boat. Because here's what's important for me about it. Of course, it's a, it's a workhorse boat from the, the, the first century. Yeah, it's the sort of boat that we're imagining Jesus using, of course. But what's important for me is this. When you look at this boat, it's so sad. It's being patched. There's, I think, 12 different types of wood in the boat. 12 different types of wood. The keel is made from one good piece of cedar wood, but that's taken from an older boat, you can still see the markings. And the rest of the, the keel is jujube wood, not quite rubbish, but close. The, the planks, the stakes along the side are made by putting pieces of wood together. It's been patched and nursed and kept afloat by very good boat rights with inadequate materials. It shows me the squeeze on the lake under Antipas's commercialization. And then one day, they couldn't keep it afloat any longer. It didn't sink in a storm. It was simply stripped. They took off the stem post, the stern post, the mast, every usable nail, anything that could be used, pushed it out into the lake, let it bury in the sort of a graveyard for boats off Magdala, off the boat rights shop. So when I look at that boat, it is the symbol for me of peasants struggling hard with great skill but inadequate materials to keep their poor boat afloat. It's only one boat. It's the only one we ever found. I cannot prove anything by it. It could be just a random example. But for me, it is a symbol of the squeeze. And it tells me why Jesus had left Nazareth and come to Capernaum, because that's where the action is. That's where the justice of God and the power of Rome met one another on the beaches around Magdala, Bethany and Capernaum in the first century. That points us towards Herod Antipas. And to try and understand, what is Herod Antipas up to? We are now in the generation 
of John and Jesus. Herod the Great was the generation before. His son, Herod Antipas, is the generation of Jesus. So let's focus on Antipas for a moment. Antipas was the man who would be king. <laughs> His whole drive was to become king of the Jews, like his father. Remember, Herod the Great, Rome appointed king of the Jews. Only Rome could appoint king of the Jews. When Herod died, there were various contenders, his sons, for the title king of the Jews. And what Augustus did was simply divide the country between them. Archelaus got the south and the title of Ethnarch, people ruler. Poor old Antipas was put in the north and he was called a tetrarch. Not a monarch, but a quarter monarch. A little kingling, as it were. To understand Antipas, all his life he wanted to be king of the Jews like his father. So, for example, under Augustus, as I just mentioned, when Herod the Great died, he went to Rome to plead his case. He pleaded before Augustus. And Augustus sent him back, and I imagine him coming back a little bit with his tail between his legs, to become tetrarch of Galilee and Perea. He didn't make it. So, under the first of the three Roman emperors under whom he lived, Augustus, he tried and failed to become king of the Jews by going all the way to Rome. Now, let me jump forward a little bit. Under the third monarch, the third one, Caligula, he was tetrarch under Augustus, under Tiberius, under Caligula. The final one, under Caligula, jumping Tiberius for the moment, he went to Rome again to try and become king of the Jews, and this time, instead of ending up as a tetrarch, he ended up as an exile. Because unfortunately for him, there was another Herodian prince. We know him as Herod Agrippa I. Growing up in Rome, friend of Claudius, friend of Caligula, he became king of the Jews, and poor old Antipas ended up in exile. So hold those as sort of the bookends of his life, because we're going to focus on Tiberius. Under Tiberius, he made his major move to become king of the Jews. Augustus died in 14, 14 CE. Tiberius became ruler. And to understand what's going on in the generation of Jesus, focus on Antipas and his move under Tiberius to become king of the Jews. What would he have to do to become king of the Jews? Well, he'd have to, first of all, up his tax base in Galilee. He would have to persu persuade his Roman masters, look how well he did in Galilee. Just think how well he'd do if he gave him the whole country. So he has to up his tax base. But he can't up his tax base with peasants who are pretty much living at subsistence level and push them into revolt because that's the fastest way to become a next tetrarch. Mm. So how does he up his tax base, but not push his peasants into revolt? So that's his first problem. There'll be a second problem we'll see in a minute. So his first problem is up my tax base without pushing my peasants into revolt. How do I do that? Here is my capital at Sepphoris. It's a beautiful city. Um, small, but very elegant. It's rich valleys all around it. I have learned how to multiply the loaves. I think I learned how to multiply the fishes. I got it, says Antipas. I can commercialize the lake. That's it. I can't push much more out of the land. My peasants are at subsistence level. What about the lake? That's what I'll do. I'll build a new capital city. Now, that's a sort of an extraordinary thing. You don't go around building new capital cities, short of an earthquake or something like that, ruins your old position. Why would you shift your capital city, say, 20 miles to the east? That's a huge expense and it's going to annoy everyone. Think of your aristocrats who have a nice suburban villa outside Sepphoris. They're not going to like this move. Lots of people are going to dislike this move. There had to be a big reason for it. He's going to build a new capital city on the lake. He's going to call it, of course, Tiberius. That's like his father made Caesarea for Caesar Augustus. He will make Tiberius 
for Tiberius. But that doesn't explain where. It would have been a lot less expensive to have changed the name of Sepphoris to Tiberius, put up a beautiful triumphal arch or whatever in honor of the new emperor. He didn't have to do all of this unless he has a bigger goal in mind. He's over at the lake to commercialize the lake. And he's going to be right there with the city. Now, try and imagine what that does to the fishers on the lake, to the peasant fishers who probably, probably, were able to own their boats, launch their boats, beach their catches, without probably particular new taxation. Now, all of a sudden, you're probably going to be taxed to own your boat. <laughs> you're probably going to be taxed on your catch, and you may have to sell it to his fish factories. He's going to have salted fish. He's going to have dried fish. He's going to make that execrable fish sauce that the Romans loved called garum. He's going into the export business. And this is not good news for peasant fishers who have made part of their livelihood on the land and part of their livelihood on the lake. So start to imagine why Jesus is over there by the lake. He's there because that's where the action is. That's where the problem is. That's where Romanization comes down to a piece of beach, as it were. It comes down to the fishes. So hold on to that. That's the first thing, first important thing about his program. But there's a second thing. Remember what Herod the Great did to appeal to his Roman masters? He built Caesarea, of course, to appeal to his Jewish subjects. He improved the temple with that great court of the Gentiles. So Antipas is always watching daddy, as it were. He's watching his father. It's another of those cases, maybe, of the son who wants to be as good or better than his father. Always a dangerous goal, by the way. So what do I do for my Jewish subjects? OK, the, the tax base and the, the fish, is not, that's for the Romans. What do I do for my, my subjects? Hmm, what did my father do? Herod the Great had tried to forge a relationship, remember, with the Hasmonean dynasty, which had been rejected by the Romans in favor of the Herodians. Herod the Great had married a Hasmonean princess called Mariame. Later he executed her, but he was trying to keep some relationship between the Herodians and the Hasmoneans. So the great solution, the second great solution for his Jewish subjects of Antipas, is to find himself a Hasmonean princess and marry her. And the available one is the one we know as Herodias. And Josephus says he fell in love with Herodias, and maybe he did. Uh, I don't know what he fell into, but he fell into the most correct political move he should make. He needed a Hasmonean connection. He needed a Hasmonean princess. And he got the granddaughter of the beloved Mariame. He married Herodias. Now he's got the two things going for him. He's made his move to become king of the Jews on two fronts. On the one front, he's upping his tax base by commercializing the lake. On the other hand, he's married a Hasmonean princess, and he's forged a Hasmonean-Herodian connection, and his program is up and running. And Josephus, by the way, calls him the friend of Tiberius. It looked really good. If you were there, say, in the year 20, in the year 20, the year that Tiberius, that I'm talking now about the city, the year that Tiberius opened for business and minted its first coins with the reed on it, you would have said, yeah, he's probably going to make it. He's made exactly the right moves. So think of all the implications. Think now of the 20s in the territories of Herod Antipas and begin to understand why two populist movements might start to resist him. It's not bad enough and desperate enough now to talk of armed revolt. But you're beginning to see why precisely then Jesus, John the Baptist, John the Baptist in Perea, Jesus in Galilee, the two parts of his territories, might resist him at that time. And we're beginning to see why people might be ready for that message. I'm not saying that, say, a Mary of Magdala is out of business and looking for a job, working with Jesus, as it were. 
I'm saying that when Jesus' message is that the kingdom of God is about justice on this earth and its fair distribution, he's talking to people who've just experienced what unfair mal distribution looks like. He's talking to fishers who say, we didn't, we, we didn't do anything wrong. Why did everything change? We've worked hard all our lives. We had our small little farms. We could supplement our income by fishing on the lake. We did nothing wrong. Why did everything change? This is not just. So when, for example, you hear John the Baptist saying and criticizing the marriage of Herod Antipas to Herodias, don't think it's just a moral condemnation. It's putting, putting a big pin in the balloon of his appeal to popular support. So he's not going to be very kind to John's criticism. And when Jesus says, when Jesus says, you ca a man cannot divorce his wife and marry another, and a female cannot divorce her husband and marry another, don't imagine that there's peasant divorces all over Galilee. There probably isn't. It's too expensive to <laughs> give back <laughs> the dowry. He's, Jesus is speaking directly at Antipas. He's criticizing this marriage, which is support to garner complete support from his Galilean peasants, and he's ruining the whole program. So, we're beginning to see then, why did the Baptist movement of John, the kingdom movement of Jesus, happen precisely in the territories of Herod Antipas in the 20s? Because by 20, B, 20 CE, 20 of the first century, Tiberius is finally open for business as usual, and Romanization, has finally hit Galilee. Because remember, under Herod the Great, which we talked about in the last session, under Herod the Great, all the Romanization was consecrated in the south. On Caesarea, the, the, the temple in Jerusalem, it's almost like Herod the Great had skipped Galilee, so Romanization finally hits Galilee hard under Herod Antipas and focuses on Tiberius by the 20s.